Who? Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And you view Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Parliament isn't even back, and yet it's felt like one of the busiest political weeks in a long time. Two uh, speeches from the leaders of the two largest parties in this country and proposed legislation too. Uh, where is the economy in all of this? And of course, how does royalty fit into the mix? We'll explore it all in the briefing after the headlines. Good morning, it's 9.31. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Prince Harry says he saw a red mist in Prince William during an argument with him, claiming his brother wanted Harry to hit him back, but he chose not to. In a new trailer for ITV's interview with the Duke of Sussex, he talks about the alleged physical attack by Prince William in 2019, detailed in his memoir, Spare. He describes his brother's level of frustration and compares it to similar feelings he experienced for so many years. The royal also says he wants reconciliation with his family, but first, he says, there needs to be accountability. Former royal correspondent Charles Ray told us this could be the end of Harry's relationship with the royal family. These are machine gun revelations and accusations, and it is staggering that he's come out with all this stuff. I mean, it, to a point of being disgusting with some of the revelations. I don't believe that Harry's ever going to be forgiven for doing what he's done with this book. I mean, the documentaries in the Opera Winfrey were bad enough, but this book is, is way out there, really is. Passengers are experiencing yet more travel disruption today on the fourth consecutive day of train strikes. RMT and 14 train operators have walked out over jobs, pay and conditions. Only 20% of services are operating as normal. Negotiations are expected to continue next week, but the unions are accusing the government of blocking a deal, which the government denies. Ukraine's calling Russia's order for a 36-hour ceasefire a trick. President Vladimir Zelensky says Moscow will use the time to regroup their forces. Kyiv wants the Kremlin's troops to leave occupied territories before a temporary truce can happen. It's set to start at around noon today. And the health secretary signing an agreement today that he says could speed up research into cancer treatments. Steve Barclay says the deal with BioNTech means cancer patients in England will get early access to experimental trials, including cancer vaccines. In total, 10,000 doses of personalised therapies could be delivered to patients by 2030. TV online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. I was back to the briefing with Tom. Good morning, it's 9.34 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Well, first this morning, the results of the latest GB News commissioned People's Poll. They're in, and they once again reveal a valuable insight into the state of the nation. The small boats crisis remains an area of real concern, of course. 57% of people, when polled, say they are not confident in the government, while only 4% are completely or fairly confident in the government's ability to solve the problem. A real key test there for Rishi Sunak. Meanwhile, when it comes to voting intention, the Conservatives remain at an historic low of just 22 points in the polls, while the Labour Party sits at a high of 46 points, a 24-point lead overall. And of course, with a lead like that, it would be remiss to look over the plans of the party that now calls itself a government in waiting. Yesterday, Sir Keir Starmer delivered a keynote speech in which he said, amongst other things, 
that he would not reach for the big government checkbook once again. It was more of a broad brush approach than a speech in which we learned many particulars. But how might a new self-styled, fiscally responsible Labour Party manage the economy? How might it be different from today? Well, Jonathan Portas is Professor of Economics and Public Policy at King's College London and joins me now. Uh, thank you for making the time this morning, Jonathan. I, I, I suppose, first of all, are you surprised by how uh, rigorously the Labour Party is now sticking to this sort of soundbite that they're not going to be a, a big spending, a deficit spending party anymore? Um well, not that surprised. Um, remember, Labour has done this ever since 1997, when Tony Blair pledged to match uh, the Conservative spending plans. Um, that was also true um, in the 2015 election. Indeed, even Jeremy Corbyn um, claimed that uh, his party's policies were fully costed. That is to say that spending increases were matched by tax increases. Now, um, as with all manifestos, those numbers didn't really add up particularly well. Neither did, of course, the Conservatives. Um, but this sort of um, lip service to fiscal responsibility is something that all governments and oppositions do. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not surprised that they're saying it. The question is, as you say, well, what does that really mean in practice? What are they going to do? Um, I think what would what I would be concerned about is that they repeat the mistake which Blair and Brown made which was to promise to stick to, not only promise to stick to the Conservative spending plans, which Ken Clark, the then Conservative Chancellor, later admitted were completely unrealistic and crazy, but they did stick to it, um, which in the early years of the Labour government did quite a bit of damage to public services. And then they swung completely in the other direction, realised that this was a mistake and just threw money at public services, uh, with the result, of course, that a lot of it, you know, public services did then improve, but quite a bit of the money was, frankly, not spent that well. And that sort of boom and bust approach for spending on the public services, really, you know, whatever you think about what the right level of tax and spending is, is not a very good way to run a government. Uh, are we now in an era where that level of tax and spend really does have to match itself much more than previously thought? What has the Liz Truss experiment taught us about the uh, appetites in international markets uh, or, or the willingness to lend money to this country if, if, uh, if it looks like this country is going to be spending through deficit? Um, th that's right. I mean, things have changed. So in the early 2010s, I and I think a lot of sort of mainstream economists in a Keynesian tradition said that the government could and should um, borrow considerably more because um, interest rates were extremely low, both here and internationally. It was absolutely clear that the markets thought that more deficit spending was perfectly prudent and were prepared to finance it. Indeed, they wanted to finance it. Um, and hence, unfortunately, the government didn't listen then. We got austerity with the, and we're still seeing the damaging effects of that now. Um, unfortunately, of course, um, the, those circumstances have changed. The constraints on public spending and borrowing are much tighter in an era where inflation is high and where long term interest rates are going up. Again, both here and internationally. So tax and spending will, you know, not on a year-to-year -year basis, but over the, the, the next decade at the moment, it looks like taxes and spending will have to match much more closely than they have in the past. So, uh, uh, um, you know, that, that environment has changed. And that means, I, you know, my view, as you know, is that given the quality of public services we have now, given what the British people actually want. That means that over the medium to long term, taxes are going to have to rise. This government has already set out some proposals for doing that, but I think more is likely to be required. It's interesting, however, because the Labour Party is not wanting to say that it would raise a single tax. Whenever it's asked about how it would pay for things, it talks about, frankly, uh, things that aren't going to bring in much money at all, relatively irrelevant strands of the economy. Non-DOMs, for example, which at the upper end, I think, has been estimated could bring in £3 billion. This £3 billion is meant to be the Labour Party pitch to fix the NHS. 
whereas £50 billion in real terms has gone into the NHS over the last 12 years. I'm not sure how an extra £3 billion will change it. Are the Labour Party being honest when they're talking about what sort of taxes they might raise, or are we just not going to see a particular transformation of public services under the Labour Party? Well, what they'll actually do, I don't know. But your basic point is absolutely right. That if they want to deliver what they seem to be, what they would like to deliver and want, or at least want to give the impression that they're going to deliver in terms of public services, that means um, additional tax rises that are not in their current plans. Now, there are ideas about how you might do that. For example, um, I think you know, economists across the political spectrum agree, regardless of what level of tax you want, that the current system of taxation for property, council taxes, stamp duty and business rates is a complete mess um, and it needs um, reform. Now, you could reform that without raising more money, or of course, you could reform it and raise some more money if you wanted to finance public services. Similarly, the current way that we tax capital gains and wealth, um, there are proposals uh, that would allow you to unify the taxation of capital gains, inheritance tax and wealth. Um, again, you could do that on a revenue neutral basis if you wanted to. That would improve the system without raising money. Or you could do it in such a way as to raise more money for public services, which is what I would favour. But those are the sort of choices we actually ought to be talking about, the parties ought to be arguing about. And as you say, uh, um, you know, that those issues, unfortunately, are largely being dodged. And, and whenever anyone brings up the question of a land value tax or similar, you get the accusations that, that people are coming to grab your gardens and the rest of it. We saw some of that in the 2017 election. However, I, I wonder how possible it is to look at sort of shifting the, 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 the um, area of tax from uh, income to anything else, given we know the structure of the electorate, given we know that the people who are the most powerful voting bloc are those who tend to uh, hold property rather than potentially earn income. Uh, given that the Labour Party is going after this same group of voters, uh, and we know that people basically over the age of 50 are the most powerful group of voters in the country, is that really going to change the policy prospectus all that much at all? Well, um, you're right. And the answer is it, it's quite easy for economists like me or indeed journalists like you to say, oh, it would be more rational and fairer. Um, you know, it would uh, uh, um, be more progressive and it would be more economically efficient to have a different system of taxing uh, property and indeed, uh, indeed wealth. It's not so easy for politicians. Um, what I think that probably and you, know, you and I would agree on is that hopefully um, in some ways, things have got so bad. It's got, you know, the, the current system of taxation uh, um, is such a mess. It's so inconsistent and so unfair in some respects that maybe even, uh, you know, people like me over 50, uh, even if we're not, they're not economists, are beginning to realise that the country as a whole would be better off with a different approach. So maybe under you know, whether it's under this government or the Labour Party or some other configuration, maybe that will be possible in the next 10 years in a way which it hasn't been in the last 20. Oh, gosh, if there were a more rational approach to a lot of these things, this country could be a lot richer. Perhaps new houses might even be built. But um, I'm not sure we're in that political space quite yet. But it's been a fascinating conversation. Jonathan Portis, thank you so much for joining us here on The Briefing this morning. Uh, now, something that thank we didn't you. cover in that conversation was the strikes, of course, that are affecting this country. The Labour Party has been putting itself in a fairly middling position on this issue. However, one thing that Sir Keir Starmer did say yesterday was that he would repeal any new anti-strike legislation brought forward by this government. Let's have a listen to what Pat McFadden, the, chief, the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, said when he spoke to GB News earlier this morning. No one wants to see them, but they happen because union members vote for them. And with the government uh, bringing forward this legislation, what they're actually doing is striking a pose rather than striking a deal because even their own transport secretary has acknowledged that this legislation wouldn't do anything to resolve the current disputes. And the way through this is to negotiate a settlement, not to uh, legislate for some date in the future while the current disputes are going on. There's not a single public service in the country uh, that is working better now than uh, before the, the Tories came to power. What's important here is to invest in public services, but to do it 
in a responsible and fiscally sustainable way. So there we have it, a clear dividing line now between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, at least on one issue, and that is minimum service level legislation. The government's promise now to bring forward that minimum service level legislation to ensure that areas like the health service, like uh, the trains and everything else, uh, can run even during strikes at a minimum level. But um, let's continue on this issue of strikes because the Prime Minister continues to, to scramble on getting a handle on this wave of industrial action crippling the public sector. Uh, let's talk now to Paul Hawkins, our national reporter who joins us from Euston Station. Uh, good morning, Paul. Um, this is the fifth day now of these strikes. Yeah. yeah. Fifth day uh, of these uh, strikes. We had uh, a 48 hour strike on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, we had the uh, strike from Aslef on uh, yesterday. They're the uh, train drivers union. And then today uh, and tomorrow, uh, another uh, RMT uh, walkout. So that's over three weeks. Uh, of strikes from uh, the RMT alone. That's over three weeks in lost pay, lost money for taxpayers and the uh, economy. But yeah, it's, it, it feels like Groundhog Day, frankly. If it's not uh, a day with a, a story about Prince Harry, it's a, it's a day with a story about uh, rail strikes. Although this is against the backdrop of that legislation that you've just been uh, talking about. And interestingly, early on in this industrial dispute, I was speaking to Mick Lynch from the uh, RMT and he was saying that he wasn't happy with Keir Starmer's position. He felt that he was a bit weak in his support uh, for the industrial uh, action. But he was happy with what he heard from Sir Keir Starmer in his speech uh, yesterday and uh, uh, clearly very unhappy, like a lot of unions are, with this, uh, what they're calling anti-strike uh, legislation. This is what Mick uh, Lynch from the RMT had to, sp uh, had to tell me earlier. First of all, I want to talk to you about this, uh, these anti-strike laws that the government wants to introduce. How are you feeling about it? Well, we feel outraged, like everyone else. It's been a set piece this week. This, this government could have got some talks on this week, but instead they wanted to frame their announcement in the context of some railway strikes. So rather than talking to us from December the 15th, they've decided to wait till next Monday so that they could make this announcement. And, of course, what this is is an attack on human rights and civil liberties. It's most important in a free society that we have free trade unions. And now that they've lost the argument about the issues, about how public services are funded, how public sector workers are treated, they, and they've also lost the argument on the, the existing anti-trade union laws because every union is defeating them by having mass ballots. They want to make the action that comes out of those ballots virtually illegal. Working people are not going to put up with, a, with an oppression of their rights and we'll, we'll fight back, we'll oppose it in Parliament, we'll oppose it on the streets and we'll oppose it in the workplace. Uh, to be fair to Grant Shapps, he did say yesterday that he wanted to make it clear that he respects workers' rights to strike and that he thinks it's part of a healthy democracy and he wants to make it clear that he, you know, that right is respected. He just wants to minim bring in minimum uh, levels of service. Well, he doesn't respect the right to strike. He wants to make the strikes ineffective. But what he'll actually do... You don't believe him when he says that? I don't believe him at all. I don't think he's genuine. I think he just wants to suppress the trade unions so he doesn't put up with the argument. He wants to make strikes ineffective. It won't resolve any dispute. It will just make the action longer uh, uh, and more bitter, if you like. So it won't work. And what he will do, end up doing is conscripting Labour. Uh, they're going to make us name people to go to work when we've had lawful ballots. That's a ridiculous situation in a free society. We don't want to take action, we want a solution. But the mandate is there. If we can't get any movement and get a resolution, we'll have to resort back to being back on the picket lines. Yeah, which, is, which has now cost, what, your members over three weeks in, in wages? It's cost the economy billions of pounds, it's yeah. cost taxpayers lots of money. What do you say to people like that, especially those in the hospitality industry that have lost a lot of money? Uh, I'd say to them that we're really sorry about that. Billions of pounds have been wasted while the government's been sitting on its hands. These train operating companies are making profit today when the trains aren't running. They're indemnified for their costs. And the, if I was in the hospitality industry or the entertainment industry, I'd be fuming about the losses, the unnecessary losses that this government is causing while they are subsidising first group go ahead a bellio and the national railways of France, Spain, Italy and the Netherlands to not run trains. 450 million pounds will be made 
by the uh, train operating companies during this period. They made profit all during the pandemic when those hospitality industries lost money because this government is subsidising this industrial dispute. That is an outrage and it's got to be addressed. And if I was the hospitality industry, I'd be knocking on the door of number 10 and demanding a resolution to this dispute. Yeah, you can see that uh, full interview on our YouTube and uh, Twitter channels. But uh, the dispute continues and there will be talks next week. What I would say is that from the union's point of view, they still have to see the wording of this primary legislation before they react fully. And they are consulting QCs. But it's, it's certainly given uh, got the union's backs up ahead of that meeting. And it doesn't seem to have been uh, conducive to more positive talks which are taking place next week. Yeah, it will be fascinating to see that wording of the legislation when it does come out. We will be following every jot and tittle of it here on the briefing. But for now, Paul Hawkins, thank you for joining us there live from Euston Station. Uh, finally, this morning, we're turning our attention north to Holyrood, where a number of MSPs have voiced serious concerns about what they perceive as the abandonment of the founding principles of the Parliament. That the Scottish Government is forcing through laws with a lack of proper scrutiny and debate, stifling Scottish democracy. Well, Murdo Fraser is Member of Parliament, Member of the Scottish Parliament for Mid Scotland and Fife, one of those representatives calling for reform, and he joins me live this morning. Um, Murdo, what's your issue? I think there's a, a number of different issues that are coming together here in terms of the way that the Scottish Parliament is performing and these concerns have been raised not just by conservative colleagues of mine but increasingly across the political spectrum including by uh, one very prominent former uh, SNP uh, cabinet uh, member uh, Alec Neil and I think you only have to look at some of the legislative output of the Scottish Parliament to see that we have a we have a problem there's not been sufficiently rigorous scrutiny of some of the legislation that Parliament has passed in recent years, which essentially has created bad law, bad law that then runs into challenges in the courts. So just to give just to give a few brief examples, we had the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act, which tried to outlaw the singing of particular songs at football games. That uh, faced legal challenges. It was ridiculed by the legal profession. And in due course, when the SNP lost their majority in the 2016 election, was repealed by Parliament because there was no longer a majority for it. Mm -hmm. uh, we then saw the hate crime legislation, again, politically very controversial uh, with their ongoing legal concerns. Uh, and we just saw before Christmas the passing of the uh, Gender uh, uh, Recognition Reform Act, which whatever your views on, on, the, on the principle of self-ID for those uh, who wish to change gender, uh, created a, a huge debate about the fact that this legislation was being railroaded through Parliament on a very, very tight timetable when there were very substantial legal issues which were not being properly addressed. And that's led to a situation now where the, the UK government is threatening to block this legislation because the Scottish Parliament didn't properly consider the interrelationship between changing uh, gender rules in Scotland and the impact this might have on the Equality Act 2010, which is a UK piece of legislation that provides protection for uh, uh, biological sex as a protected characteristic. So, for example, would somebody in Scotland who has a gender recognition certificate saying they're a woman, if they cross the border and travel to England, how would that be recognised? And, and, and that hasn't been resolved. So we have, a, we have, we have a, a body of legislation that's been passed by Holyrood where there hasn't been a proper scrutiny uh, and legal issues have not been properly addressed. And I think that points to a failure in terms of the processes at Holyrood that doesn't allow mm. a proper detailed debate. And, and, just, and, and, to, just, and to what extent yeah. is this to what extent is this the fact of a majority government, or at least a government that can cobble together a majority with a, a number of parties setting their own parliamentary timetables? Is this something that is can be addressed by a different way of setting out what debates get, what sort of time and, and, and how much time you actually get on the floor of the debating chamber? So, 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 so part of this is, is, a, is a process and structure issue, a part of it is a culture issue. So you're absolutely right, uh, there's a particular problem, and we saw this when the SNP had a majority, 
They don't have a majority now, but they have a coalition with the Greens, which creates a majority. They therefore control the parliamentary timetable. So, for example, with the gender recognition reform bill, they were determined for reasons that are not entirely clear to, to push this through in the week before Christmas, which meant that debate inevitably was going to be truncated. Um, and, and that, of course, led to an unprecedented a rebellion within the SNP, where nine SNP MSPs out of 64 voted against the legislation. And, and that was, was something that you know, we very rarely see, because in, unlike at Westminster, where you know, within the Conservative ranks at Westminster, you will see rebellions all the time on all range of issues, whether it's, whether it's planning laws or immigration or whatever it might be, uh, the SNP keep a very tight grip on their members. So, so there's a culture issue, but I think it goes beyond that. There, there's actually an issue with process about a lack of um, time to properly consider legislation and ensure that uh, when it's, unlike in Westminster where you have a revising chamber, where the House of Commons might pass a bill, it then goes to the Lords. There is time for, for detailed scrutiny to address uh, serious legal issues and kick it back to the Commons. That doesn't happen. Once the Scottish Parliament votes on a bill, it goes straight for royal assent. Um, and that, I think that there's issues with the process. Therefore, I think we need to look at it. It's really fascinating because so often we'll see some sort of enormous scandal, whether it's over ferries or whether it's over sending uh, COVID positive patients into care homes that, that, that the Scottish government has complete culpability for. And yet it doesn't get the same scrutiny. It doesn't get the same parliamentary scrutiny or indeed media coverage. That's something that the UK government does. Uh, how can we do better in the media here? So that, that's a really interesting point, Tom. If you, if you take the current crisis in the NHS, so we have an NHS crisis in Scotland. Um, and, and let's remember the difference. You know, thanks to the Barnett formula, the Scottish government has about £2,000 per head of population to spend more on public services than the UK government has. Uh, and that means that there's far more money being spent on the NHS in Scotland, and yet the outcomes we see are just the same as the rest of the UK, and in some cases actually much worse. Wow. So we have the same crisis with A&E and elsewhere. And I think we have to, to, to put the, the, the Scottish government under the same level of scrutiny as you see Conservative ministers. But, I'm afraid I'm going to have to interrupt you there. We've run to the end of the programme, but thank you so much for getting that in really important points. That's it for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of The Briefing. I'm back on Monday, but up next, it's Esther and Phil. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank. Fun, fearless, and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. Hello, I'm Esther Agvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. 
If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Monday to Thursday, 